sounds good. Should we start? Okay, perfect. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to present this webinar. And if you are in Toronto or the GTA, like Nicole and I are, um, it's probably the perfect day for this webinar because there's really no sun. It's a pretty dreary day here. Um, so we're excited to talk to you about this. Um, just a disclosure that we wanted to start with, our webinar today is generously sponsored by Get Cracking, which is the Egg Farmers of Canada, and Produce Made Simple. Be sure to check them out on Instagram, and you can see their handles there. And as always, all of the opinions and information we're sharing today is genuine, and it's based on evidence. As, register, as registered dietitians, we practice based on evidence. So my name's Christina Iaboni. I've been a dietitian for about 12 years now, and I spent a lot of that time working in a mental health hospital in Toronto. Um, I left last year to do more entrepreneurial work and to have more balance with my family because I have two little kids. Um, but that's really where my passion for this area developed um, for spending so much of my career working in mental health. Um, now I'm a recipe developer, a nutrition communications expert, and I have a healthy living blog. And that's my website and my Instagram below. And hello, everyone. My name is Nicole Addison. You might know me from my social media pages, which I go by the handle Nourish by Nick on. So for the past two years, I've been a registered dietitian, specifically focusing on reaching people through social media. After I completed my master's in nutrition communication, I really wanted to make it my mission to make healthy eating as easy and accessible to as many people as possible. And I thought social media was a really great place to be able to do that. So through my social media and my blog, I focus on sharing easy nutrition tips and recipes that help prove nutritious eating doesn't need to be overly complicated or time consuming. So I'm really excited to be able to partner with Christina on this because I know the dark, dreary skies have been really getting to me this winter because there's been a lot of them. So I know Christina has a ton of mental health experience that we'll be able to share with you today. So before we begin, we do want to note that all the information presented and written within this presentation is intended for general teaching and informational purposes only. If you have any concerns or questions about your health and or nutrition needs, please consult your physician and or a registered dietitian. This webinar is also not meant as a replacement for any medical advice. So if you are struggling with your mental health, we encourage you to please get help from a medical professional. So thank you again for joining us. This is what we're going to be going over today. We're going to start with an overview of what the winter blues are, as well as going over some just basic brain information. Then we're going to move into some key nutrients needed for brain health. We'll talk about some specific foods, and then we'll move into a few specific dietary patterns that might be beneficial to help incorporate those key nutrients into your actual lifestyle. We're going to briefly touch on the gut-brain connection, and then we'll move into a cooking demonstration where Christina is going to make a sheet pan mushroom omelet um, using Ontario mushrooms and greens, and I will make apple pie cinnamon breakfast cookies using Ontario apples. And we will leave some time at the end for questions, um, so you can feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, we'll ask that you use the Q&A box and we'll save the chat for another question that we have throughout um, the session. So what are the winter blues? So those are the low emotions that come with these cold and dark winter days. Um, as Nicole and I both mentioned, it's been really gloomy these last couple of months here. Um, so you may feel like you wanna stay in bed longer. You might wanna eat more comfort foods. Those are typically foods that are high in carbohydrates for most of us. I know they are for me. You may feel like staying home and watching your favorite show on Netflix rather than going out and socializing with friends and family. Uh, the winter blues and seasonal affective disorder, which is some often known as SAD, 
are different. So about 15% of people in Canada experience the winter blues, but only two to 3% experience seasonal affective disorder. And seasonal affective disorder is a diagnosed condition where someone regularly has depression in the winter. Um, and it's serious enough that it can impair their daily life. And this is something diagnosed by a medical professional and they would have uh, individual treatment. So today we're just talking about the winter blues and ways to eat healthy um, for brain health. So how are brain health and mental health connected? The brain is probably the most complex and possibly the most fascinating organ in our body. It's responsible for everything from how we move to how we communicate, how we make decisions and how we interpret our surroundings. It also processes our thoughts, behaviors, feelings, and emotions. According to the World Health Organization, brain health is the state of brain functioning across cognitive, sensory, social, emotional, behavioral, and motor domains, allowing a person to realize their full potential over their life course. Mental health refers to a state of well being, so it includes our emotions, thoughts, feelings of connections to others, and being able to manage the ups and downs of life that we all go through. Looking after our brain health can improve our overall cognitive functioning, resilience, and our psychological well-being, and it helps us cope with day-to-day -day stress and live a meaningful life. So eating healthy is one aspect of keeping our brain healthy. Um, other things for brain health include like exercise, stress management, um, continuing to stimulate our brain with new learning. Um, so today we're going to just talk about the nutritional aspect because that's really where our expertise comes in. So we're just gonna run a quick poll. How would you rate your mood right now? So this is just like an, an anonymous question that you can put in. So most people are Doing okay, about 59% of us said they feel okay, about 60%, only 13% of us are feeling great. A few of us are feeling a little bit low or may have had better days. So hopefully we can give you all some information um, and things to include in your diet to, to uh, help with brain health. And hopefully we just all get some sun soon because I think yeah. that's what we all need. So before we can talk about what we should be eating for our brain, let's first go over how the brain actually works and how the foods we eat affect its functioning. So the brain is an organ and like any other organ in your body, your brain needs good quality nutrition to stay healthy and function at its peak performance. So all of our brain cells and neurotransmitters are actually created from different nutrients in the body, which I think is a really cool fact. So this means that what you eat can affect the structure of the brain and how it actually functions. So our brain is made up of billions of nerve cells, which are called neurons, and they're responsible for helping send different signals and messages from the brain to the entire body. So the neurons use chemicals, which are called neurotransmitters, to send signals or those messages to each other and to other target cells in the body. So three key neurotransmitters that you may have heard of before are dopamine, which are, is known as our feel-good hormone. It can help regulate our attention, alertness, pleasure, and motivation. Serotonin is another one. This one can help regulate our moods, our sleep, and relaxation. And what's really interesting about serotonin is that low levels have actually been found to be linked with depression and anxiety. And finally, there's GABA, which can regulate our anxiety, stress, calmness, and sleep. So you can see that all three of these will play a role in how you're feeling overall and your mental health, mental functioning throughout the day. So did you know that every day we need between 40 to 50 nutrients for our body and our brain to function properly? So we can break these down to basically six essential nutrients. So there's carbohydrates, protein, and fat, and these are known as the macronutrients, basically meaning we need these in larger amounts, and then vitamins and minerals, which are micronutrients and needed in small amounts. So those include everything from like our calcium, vitamin D, vitamin C, potassium, iron, all of those. And then of course, water, which is really important for just our overall health, um, 
and even our brain health as well. Neurotransmitters are mainly made from amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, but vitamins and minerals are also needed. So the first macronutrient that we're going to talk about is fat. And fat is really important from the brain. And actually, 60% of our brain is made from fat. About 20% of this fat comes from essential fatty acids. And these mean, this simply means that we need to get these fats from food because our body can't produce them. So omega-3 and omega-6 are two essential fats that are really important for the structure of brain cells and help ensure smooth communication. So these are two healthy fats, um, and they help. Yeah, they basically help our, our brain communicate between cells. Most people are getting enough omega-6 fatty acids. It's found in a variety of different foods like vegetable and seed oils, nuts and seeds, um, and avocados. But most of us are not doing so good with omega-3s, um, which is what we're going to talk about next. Yeah, so like Christina mentioned, we might not be getting as many omega-3s as we need. So there are three main types of omega-3 fatty acids that we want to focus on. There's DHA, which is important for the structure of our brain cells. If we don't have enough of the DHA fatty acids, other fats will need to step in to take its place. So this is a problem if they are unhealthy fats, like saturated fats or trans fats. Um, we also have EPA, which can help regulate our neuron function by helping control blood flow so that the brain is able to get the oxygen and other nutrients it might need. And it can also help us reduce inflammation throughout the body and in the brain. And lastly, there is ALA. So this one isn't as strongly linked to mental health, though it does still offer general health benefits. So it's still important to make sure we're getting enough of. And studies have actually found that a deficiency in EPA and DHA, so those first two we talked about, is common in people with neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's and neuropsychiatric conditions such as ADHD and anxiety. So they're definitely key nutrients we really want to make sure that we're getting enough of when we're thinking about mental health and our brain health. So what foods can we eat to make sure we're getting enough of them? Some options for DHA and EPA include fortified foods, um, such as eggs, seafood, and marine algae. So this can either be in the form of a supplement, um, such as a pill or a powder, edible seaweed, or even sea vegetables. Um, but the best source of DHA and EPA that we recommend are cold water fatty fishes, such as salmon, sardines, trout, mackerel, and herring. And then when we're thinking about ALA, we want to ensure that we're getting some nuts and seeds in our diet, such as walnuts, chia seeds, hemp seeds, and flax seeds, and also canola oil can be a great source of ALA as well. So now that we know how much we, or what we should be eating, the question that everyone wants to know is how much should we be eating? So the general recommendation is two servings of three ounce servings of fatty fish per week for overall heart health. And I like to say that instead of weighing a good tip to estimate a three ounce portion is approximately the size of your palm. So if you look at your palm, this serving of fish is usually enough. But for better brain health, we actually want to up that a little bit. So we want to aim for three servings of fatty fish per week. And Christina had a really great tip that she mentioned before, but our body can only convert less than 1% of ALA to that EPA and DHA that we need. So we really want to make sure we're making the most of the EPA and DHA sources that we're eating and really try to focus on better quality sources if we can. Um, so this doesn't really need to be overly complicated. We can take advantage of canned sources, frozen sources, etc. However, if you aren't someone that loves fatty fish, because I know there are people out there, you may want to consider an algae or fish-based omega-3 supplement, though we do always recommend consulting your doctor or a dietitian prior to starting any supplements. So we're going to use the chat box for this next question, but we want to talk about carbohydrates and we just want to um, get some information about you. What have you heard about carbohydrates? Because there tends to be a lot of information about them out there. So just feel free to put in something in the chat box that you may have heard about carbs. It can be positive, negative, anything. Yeah. 
Yep, we have someone that says carbohydrates provide quick energy. A third of a cup per meal is sufficient enough. I know there's a lot of talk just in general about carbohydrates in different sources. So yeah, some people are saying carbohydrates are necessary. Um, people are saying there's two different types of carbohydrates. I, I feel like carbohydrates can sometimes be something that I don't know. There's a lot of information about it and it's kind of hard to sift through like the correct information and knowing what we should actually be believing and listening to. Um, I know some people say to stay away from carbohydrates. Some people say that carbohydrates can be amazing. Some people say that we should limit them. So we're, Christina's going to dive a little bit more into some of these topics. And yeah. I think you might be interested to hear some of the things we have to say about them. Yeah. So carbohydrates are really um, the main fuel for the brain. And sometimes we refer to the brain as a glucose hog because given the size of the organ, it really takes up a lot of our glucose needs. Um, the brain needs about actually like 130 grams of carbohydrates each day. So glucose comes from carbohydrates. And these can be in the form of whole grains, fruits, vegetables, legumes like chickpeas or lentils. Dairy products like yogurt and milk contain carbohydrates. Cheese doesn't really have much carbohydrates. Um, and these are all these all break down to glucose. If you don't get enough carbohydrates, you might start to feel weak, tired. You might have like a little bit of brain fog or get a headache. And just a little fun fact, your body may actually crave more carbohydrates when you're tired as a way to get more energy. I know like when my kids were babies and I wasn't sleeping that much, I would just want to eat carbs all day. Um, because I was so tired. So I definitely see the, it's definitely true. But you want to make sure that you're choosing complex carbs, which are more slowly digested um, carbohydrates, because these will help give our brain and our body a stable supply of energy. So some sources um, of complex carbs are whole grains, so like whole grain breads, cereals, quinoa, wild or brown rice, buckwheat, amaranth, millet, bulgur, farro, or rolled or steel cut oats. Fruit will give you complex carbohydrates, it could be fresh, frozen, or dried fruit. Starchy vegetables like sweet potatoes, white potatoes, winter squash, green peas, plantains, cassava, and beets, and legumes like chickpeas and lentils. Ideally, we want to try and limit processed and refined carbohydrates. Those are the ones that are more quickly digested. And they're things like white flowers, sugary drinks, pop and juice, um, sweets and pastries. And you want to choose them occasionally. And my view on this, and maybe Nicole can offer hers as well, is I think there's no foods need to be off limits, but you want to think about how often you're having them. And I always kind of suggest if there's certain sweets that you really like, like really take the time to savor them, um, eat them mindfully, and choose them on occasion. Yeah, I definitely agree. So next up in our key nutrients is a vitamin I definitely don't think is talked about enough, and that's B vitamins. So B vitamins are a key, key nutrient that can help us break down the carbohydrates in our body to actually allow them, allow us to use them for energy. And they're also really important for brain health as they can help us maintain our brain cells and also create new neurotransmitters. So that's the chemical that helps us transmit the single signals from our brain to our body. So there are eight different types of B vitamins, and these include B1, which is thiamine, B2, which is riboflavin, B3, which is niacin, B6, pantotonic acid, biotin, B12, folate, otherwise known as folic acid in supplement form, and finally choline, which is a key B vitamin that we're going to dive a little bit more into today. Um, but most of these vitamins can't be stored by the body, so they do need to be eaten regularly as part of your diet. So they're definitely something that you might want to consider thinking about a little bit more. And some signs of a B vitamin deficiency include fatigue, irritability, poor concentration, anxiety, and I'm sorry, and depression. And the good news is B vitamins can be found in a wide range of foods. So 
and we also don't need them in huge, huge amounts. So typically if you are eating a diet that is varied and balanced and includes colorful vegetables, lean meats, and whole grains, it usually does cover all the B vitamins. So you don't need to be too concerned about making sure you're getting enough. You kind of just need to make sure you're eating as balanced as you can. B12 is also one that is a little bit unique though. So B12 is naturally only found in animal foods. So if you are vegetarian or don't eat meat, don't worry. Um, just because you may not be able to get B12 in its natural form, you might be able to get it in fortified foods such as soy or almond milk, or even in supplement form. And another thing to quickly note is that B12 absorption does decrease with age as well as certain medications. So if this is something that you might be concerned about, or you might think you might not be getting enough of, we definitely recommend speaking to a family doctor or a dietitian. Yeah, most um, in Canada, um, as far as I know, B, uh, B12 blood test is covered by OHIP. Um, but definitely, like, if you're worried about it, ask for a blood test because you wouldn't want to just start, because it, like, it's easy to go pick up a supplement, but you don't want to start taking a supplement unless you actually need it. Um, so if you are concerned, um, as Nicole said, like, just talk to your doctor about it. And so choline. So Nicole mentioned that we were going to dive into choline a little bit more. And choline is, is one of the B vitamins that I think we're starting to hear a little bit more about, which is a good thing because it's really important for our brain and our nervous system. It helps regulate memory, mood, and muscle control. And it's really important for early brain development. So for people who are pregnant, infants, young children, um, it's really important for them. And some of the best sources of choline are eggs, meat, poultry, fish, and dairy products. Two eggs contain 75% of adult choline needs and 100% of children's needs. So they're a really great source. Um, some plant-based foods like potatoes, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, some types of beans and nuts and seeds have choline in them. Um, they're not as great sources as some of the other ones that we mentioned. And protein. I always love talking about protein because it's kind of the nutrient that everyone loves in general. Like it doesn't really get a lot of bad um, publicity. And, um, but it's really important for helping us feel full um, and also helps balance our, our blood sugar, which create a stable mood and energy. So when you have carbohydrates at a meal and some protein, um, this is going to help with your blood sugar so that things are not digested too quickly. Um, it's also going to help keep you feeling full. Protein also helps make neurotransmitters, um, those happy hormones for the brain. So ideally you wanna include one protein rich food at all your meals and snacks. Most people in North America, we're really good at get, getting our protein at dinner time, and we get some at lunch, but we're not as good as getting it at, we're not as good at getting it in in the morning. Most times, like if you think if you have like just a simple bowl of oatmeal for breakfast or um, a bowl of cereal or like, toast with butter and a coffee, that's not really gonna give you very much protein at all. Um, so you wanna try and include a good protein source at breakfast. So this could be like two eggs or some Greek yogurt. Um, I always recommend making, if you have like oatmeal, make it with a, a milk that contains protein. So like cow's milk or um, soy milk have protein, usually like almond milk, um, rice milk, they don't have very much protein in them, but soy and dairy milk will give you protein. Um, some other sources of protein in general are lean meats and fish, turkey, chicken, canned tuna, salmon, whitefish, and shrimp. I'm always a big fan of promoting canned salmon because I think it's a really affordable way to get in not only protein, but those omega-3 fats that we talked about before. And especially with just prices of groceries in general, canned salmon can be an affordable way to get fatty fish into your diet, as well as sardines. I don't know, personally, I can't stomach them, but if you like sardines, they're so good for you and they're really cheap as well. Um, dairy and eggs, as I mentioned, Greek yogurt, hard cheese, cottage cheese, which is still having its moment, um, and eggs, nuts and seeds like almonds, cashews, pumpkin seeds, hemp hearts, and peanut butter. So these are more, I would consider them more of a fat, but they do have some protein in them as well. Legumes like beans, chickpeas, and lentils, and soy products like soy milk, tofu, tempeh, or edamame. So next we're gonna talk about vitamin D. So vitamin D has kind of always been known for its role in bone health. Um, but as we learn more about it, we know that it also helps produce some neurotransmitters, including serotonin. 
It helps prevent inflammation. And some studies have shown that deficiencies associated with poor mental health, um, like depression, as well as dementia and schizophrenia. And vitamin D is also important for your immune system, which at this time of year, I think is something, you know, with like a lot of the seasonal viruses going around, getting enough vitamin D uh, is important. So the best source of vitamin D um, is ideally the sun. However, in Canada from October to April, we get very little vitamin D from the sun. And even on a sunny day, if you go outside, um, you're gonna be probably pretty covered up with your hat, your gloves, your big jacket. Um, in order for our skin to actually absorb vitamin D, it needs to be directly exposed. And then even in the summer when you wear sunscreen, which we should all be doing, but as we know, um, that's also gonna block some of the vitamin D absorption. Um, so in general, most Canadians should consider a supplement, especially in the winter. Um, Health Canada recommends a supplement for everyone over the age of 50. Um, however, it's, you can always talk to your doctor about getting a supplement. Um, vitamin D blood work is not covered in Canada because in general, it can be assumed that most of us are not getting enough um, and that a supplement is, is safe. There's only a few foods that naturally contain vitamin D. One of them was egg yolks. Um, fatty fish like salmon and sardines have some, and then cow's milk and other fortified milks, as well as fortified uh, margarine. In our picture here, you can see we have an omelet with smoked salmon on a bagel. So that's gonna give a little bit of vitamin D, um, but not enough, um, which is why su a supplement should be considered. So we went over a lot of different nutrients that we should be thinking a little bit more about. about. So now let's chat about some lifestyle patterns that do a great job of incorporating some of these key nutrients to create a well-balanced diet. So the Mediterranean diet is one of them, and it's very widely known. I feel like most people might have heard about it before. And it's based on the dietary patterns followed by people in Greece and Southern Italy. And it's been shown to have physical and mental health benefits. So we're going to chat a little bit about what the Mediterranean diet is here. So the key aspects are including healthy fats and cooking oil, such as extra virgin olive oil, nuts and seeds and fatty fish, which we now know are all also great sources of omega-3s. We also wanna prioritize plant foods and fiber, including fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. It also talks about eating lean protein sources, including beans, lentils, and eggs to minimize some of the saturated fat we might be getting from other sources of meat, such as like red meat. Um, and what I find really cool about this dietary pattern is that it focuses not just on what you're eating, but also how you're eating. So some of the key messages also include focusing on fresh and local foods, cooking from scratch as often, or like cooking at home from scratch as often as possible, and also making homemade meals with family. So this is a great visual to represent the patterns that we just talked about in relation to how often they are consumed in the Mediterranean diet. You don't definitely don't need to follow this exactly, but you can see that there are different foods and food groups along the pyramid that decrease in how often they should be eaten as you move up the pyramid. So at the bottom, we have those fiber filled whole grains, beans, fruits and veggies, which are all recommended to be eaten daily. Then we move on to the olive oil and those healthy fats in the middle. And as we move up the pyramid, the recommendations change from being recommended to be eaten daily to maybe a few times per week or even less, um, which are maybe some smaller amounts throughout the week or throughout the month, which at the very top includes some sweets um, and more processed foods. The MIND diet is another diet that has been shown to um, possibly impact our brain health. So it stands for the Mediterranean DASH Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. It's quite the mouthful. Um, the DASH diet has been around for a long time. It's one of the gold standards for people who have high blood pressure to treat it. Um, this diet's relatively new, been around since 2015, and it came out of a university in the United States. And early research is showing that following the MIND diet reduces the risk of Alzheimer's disease and slows the loss of brain function over time. And the diet reduces inflammation and it's really high in antioxidant rich foods that are thought to help protect the brain from damage. So there are, there's quite a few similarities between the MIND diet and the Mediterranean diet because the MIND diet's a combination, um, but it goes a little bit further with sort of telling us exactly how much of certain things we should be having. Um, so it says like every day we should have a dark green vegetable and at least one other vegetable. Um, incorporating berries at least twice a week, having at least three servings of whole grains per day, 
beans every other day, fish at least once a week, um, poultry twice a week. And then similar to the Mediterranean diet, the um, olive oil is the main, uh, sort of the recommended fat source. Um, you wanna limit butter, margarine or fried or fast foods and then drinking water. And one thing that I often get asked about in, with these diets is that olive oil is recommended, but it's more for um, like salads or finishing your vegetables with it. You don't wanna be cooking with olive oil at a high heat. Um, so it's more like for finishing um, rather than cooking. A sample um, you know, meal plan uh, for the MIND diet for breakfast, it could be Greek yogurt with mixed berries and slivered almonds. Lunch would be a green salad with hard boiled eggs, avocados, chickpeas, uh, and an olive oil based dressing. And dinner might be baked salmon with wild rice and mixed vegetables. So you might have heard this quote before, but it's all diseases begin in the gut. Hippocrates is actually the first one that said this term, but we've actually really begun to appreciate this message fairly recently. So the gut is a key regulator when it comes to how our body functions. It's actually referred to as our second brain because of how closely connected to the brain it actually is. So there's a constant feedback loop that's always happening between both the brain and the gut. They're always in constant communication, talking back and forth to each other, sending signals and messages to each other. And you might have heard of the term gut microbiome before. You might also not have. This usually does come up when we talk about gut health because it's actually a name for the collection of all of the gut bacteria in our stomach and the intestinal tract. So this usually contains over 300 to 500 different species of bacteria, which all live inside us. And the different bacteria species that we have actually can change and be influenced by the foods that we eat over time. So ideally, we really want to try to aim for a diverse gut microbiome that contains many different species of different bacteria. So newer research is showing us that that connection between gut health and mental health and digestive orders is actually fairly strong. And this is because most of our serotonin and dopamine, which are those neurotransmitters that we talked about earlier, are actually produced in our gut. And since our healthy gut is linked to both physical and mental health, if you think about it, if your gut isn't healthy, it's going to negatively affect the constant communication and all those messages and signals it's sending back to the brain. Also, a lot of our immune system is in the gut too. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so next we're going to talk about fiber, um, which I'm sure many of you have heard of before, um, but it's really important for our gut health. And fiber is found only in plant foods, so fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, bran cereals, beans and lentils. Um, fiber helps promote the growth of good bacteria and helps maintain a healthy gut microbiome. It also helps manage our blood sugar. It can reduce cholesterol. Uh, it supports regularity and it helps with weight management because it helps us feel full. Most Canadians are only getting about half the recommended amount of fiber. On average, we're getting between like 11 and 14 grams per day. Um, but adult men need 35 to 38 grams a day and women about 25 grams a day. So we have another kind of like a sample day where um, with somewhat uh, adequate fiber. So it could be oatmeal with chia seeds and raspberries for breakfast. Lunch would be a sandwich on whole grain bread with chicken, avocado, and an apple. So fruits like apples and pears are really high in fiber, and you want to make sure you're leaving the skin on to get the most fiber out of them. Berries like raspberries are also really high in fiber, and so are avocados. Um, dinner can be a cup of whole wheat pasta with meatballs and tomato sauce and a serving of broccoli. And for snack, you might have some popcorn and almonds. Like Air Pop popcorn is actually a whole grain, and it's a really good source of fiber. So two things that we normally talk about when it comes to gut health are prebiotics and probiotics. So first, let's talk about prebiotics. So prebiotics are food probiotics in our gut actually eat. So this helps us maintain a healthy balance of bacteria because it helps keep our bacteria healthy and happy. So prebiotics are naturally found in higher fiber foods, such as bananas, Jerusalem artichokes, asparagus, leeks, and onions as well as whole grains and starches that are cooked and cooled. So this can be things such as leftover rice or overnight oats. So it might be good to think about maybe making like a fried rice with some leftover rice or 
you know, I love overnight oats and I have tons of overnight oat recipes. Um, Christina, are you able to change the slide? Thank oh, the other one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so probiotics are what we're going to talk about now. And they're the live microorganisms or bacteria that can benefit us in many ways, such as helping us digest food and help our immune system. So like I mentioned before, the gut bacteria that we already have in our digestive tract is also probiotics. But since we really want to try to make our gut microbiome as diverse as possible, we really want to try to incorporate certain probiotic containing foods as often as we can. So some great options include yogurt, fermented foods, such as kimchi, sauerkraut, and kefir. Um, and I always like to mention here too, that it is very important to make sure that you're checking the labels when you are specifically looking for probiotic containing foods, just to ensure that it does contain probiotics because for example, not all yogurts contain probiotics. You wanna make sure that the label says contains live active cultures. So like Activia is a great option if you're looking for that. Um, another thing is there are probiotic supplements. So that's another thing that you can think about um, and they might be beneficial for supporting specific conditions. So there's some that you can take for digestive support, immune health, etc. And another tip too is that if you're looking for probiotic containing foods, they're more than likely always found in the fridge just because they are live bacteria, so they need to be kept alive and they're best kept in the fridge. So, now I think we're going to do a cooking demonstration. I think Christina looks like she's yeah. ready. Yeah. I just want to make sure Cole just confirm that I have a good Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um yeah, if you yeah, crouch down just so I don't have to crouch as much. Okay. That should be perfect. Also, I do see the questions in the question and answer box. We're going to answer them at the end. Yes, definitely. Okay. So I am making a sheet pan mushroom omelet. I'm using Ontario mushrooms and spinach. Um, and what I like about this recipe is that, oh, and I should say that uh, probably by tomorrow you will get our follow-up email with um, a summary sheet and the recipes in it. But I like this recipe because it's great for meal prep. So you can make it on the weekend and then cut it up and have it throughout the week. Um, so we, you know, we talked a bit about protein and how many people don't get enough protein in the morning. So this is a good option. Um, you know, you can put it with some bread or I like to cut it up around the same size as an English muffin and put some in an English muffin with some more greens and tomatoes and have a breakfast sandwich with it, or, you know, you can have oatmeal and a piece of this. So you're getting your eggs um, with all those good vitamins and minerals in them, protein, um, and some veggies in the morning, which not everyone um, gets. So mushrooms are actually grown all year round in Canada. And you can use cremini mushrooms for this or white mushrooms. I put cremini mushrooms on the recipe, but um, they only had white mushrooms when I went to the store yesterday. So when you look for mushrooms, if you're getting them in the package with plastic, you wanna make sure that they're free from moisture. Um, and ideally like mushrooms shouldn't be too bruised. When it comes to cleaning mushrooms, you can use a damp paper towel and just kind of wipe them. The ones I have here are not too bad. They're not that dirty looking, um, but you can actually wash them in water, especially if they're really dirty. I tend to usually wash mine in water um, rather than just wiping them. They will absorb some extra water, but um, mushrooms and many other vegetables, they are high in water to begin with. Um, so you might just have to cook them a little longer to get the water out. Like once you put some salt on mushrooms, the water will start to come out or they may just take a few more minutes to brown, but it's definitely fine to wash them in water. And you may not hear about this too much, but they do have a lot of um, vitamins and minerals in them. They have a lot of B vitamins, which we talked about being important for brain health. They also have minerals like selenium and copper. Um, oh, and they have small amounts of vitamin D and vitamin C in them. So for this recipe, I just cut the bottoms off after I washed them and sliced them up. And then I sauteed them with some onion, um, with some with an onion and some mushrooms and a little bit of salt and pepper. Um, and that's my veggie filling for the omelet. And then I have some eggs here that I've already beaten up and we're using the whole egg today. Um, go for the whole egg. Yolk especially has tons of nutrients in it. So you don't wanna be getting rid of those. 
I'm gonna add a little bit of milk just to like loosen up those eggs a bit. And I'm gonna season it with a little bit of salt and some pepper. And I'm just gonna mix it up. And then this omelet, what I like is that it's baked, so you don't have to like kind of fuss over it over the stove. You don't have to worry about flipping it. Um, we know how sometimes that turns out. So you're just gonna bake it in a baking dish or a sheet pan. Make sure you grease it so it doesn't stick. And I like to start by putting my filling in. So I'm just gonna spread that in my baking dish. And then I'm just gonna pour my eggs over top. Sort of move around my veggies. And every omelet needs some kind of cheese, if you ask me. So um, in the recipe I put, you can use goat cheese or feta cheese. I'm using goat cheese today. If you use feta, just keep in mind that it's a little bit more salty. So you want to be able to, uh, or just be mindful of how much salt you season your veggies and your eggs with, because feta is more salty. And I left it in pretty big chunks and I'm just gonna scatter it on top of my eggs and veggies. And then turn around. So I'm sure, just try and angle it so you can see it. I didn't have a clear baking dish, but it's just gonna go into the oven for about half an hour until all the eggs are set. And then you can cut it up and serve it. And it comes out looking like this. So that is our easy recipe for meal prep, full of good um, veggies like those Ontario mushrooms, spinach. You could use kale or any kind of green vegetable that you like. Um, even like Swiss chard would be good. Even broccoli would work, any kind of green. Um, and yeah, and then you have it prepped for the week. And now Nicole is going to do sort of a, a sweet recipe that's also great for, for meal prep. Yeah, I was also thinking, Christina, that your a mushroom omelet would also taste good, like sliced and added to like a whole grain, like English muffin for like a meal prep. Yeah, um, for breakfast, breakfast sandwiches. sandwiches. Yeah, like I think that would be awesome. But yeah, so this one is for people that might like a little bit more of a sweet option in the morning. I know I typically tend to gravitate towards something sweet, but I am making apple cinnamon breakfast cookies featuring Ontario apples. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take two eggs. So like Christina did, we're also doing the full egg because we want to make sure that we're getting the choline, the vitamin D and the B vitamins, including B12, as well as some protein. So I always like to crack them on the counter just to make sure that you're getting a clean crack. So you can just add both of the eggs into the bowl. Like Christina said, we are going to be sending out the full recipe. So don't worry about writing everything down right now, but we're adding the wet ingredients first. So we have our eggs. We're going to add some maple syrup for some natural sweetness. And this recipe only uses a quarter cup of maple syrup because we actually are also adding some unsweetened applesauce. So this also adds some extra sweetness into the recipe, which I love. Then we're going to add a little bit of milk and some runny peanut butter. So I always suggest using runny peanut butter if you have it, just because it helps create a little bit more moisture in the recipe, so in this breakfast cookie. Um, but one good tip too, especially if you're getting to like the end of your peanut butter jar is you can microwave it for about 20 seconds in a microwave safe dish. And it helps create like that runny consistency we're looking for. And then we also can add some vanilla extra, sorry. And we're I get gonna... runny peanut butter, you mean natural peanut butter, right? So peanuts are the only ingredient. Yeah, yeah. so you always want to look for when you are buying any type of nut butter, I always recommend looking for peanut butter that just contains peanuts or contains peanuts and maybe a little bit of salt. Just because I feel like with recipes, especially when you're baking with it, you're adding other sources of sweetness. So you don't need like the sugar that typically is found in like some of the other more thicker peanut butters. So we're going to whisk that together and then... The two main ingredients for our dry ingredients are some oats and some oat flour. So I love using oat flour in recipes too because it just helps add some fiber to create some more of that lasting energy. And then we're going to add some baking powder and some cinnamon for some flavor. The cinnamon is stuck. 
Okay. Then we're going to mix that all together and you're gonna get like a batter consistency. One thing too is eau flour might be a little bit hard to find in the grocery store sometimes. And you definitely don't need to spend a lot of money on it. Cause what I like to do is I like just adding my oats to a blender, like a high powered blender or a food processor, and then just blending them for about three to five minutes, um, depending on the speed of your blender. And it creates like a nice flour, like consistency. It definitely won't have as much rise as like all purpose flour, but it is great for a recipe like these. Next, we're gonna add in one Ontario apple. So I already chopped mine up using my little fruit vegetable dicer I have just to save some time. But I like to keep the skin on my apples just because it helps add some extra fiber into this recipe while also adding some extra nutrients that you can find in it. And I also love the apples because they add texture and they add some more natural sweetness without having to add any extra sources of sugar. Um, just make sure that you're washing your apples first but we're gonna add it directly in here. And then you can just mix it all up. So you're gonna get a nice batter. Like it's not going to be like a typical dough. It's going to be more like a muffin batter almost. So these also could be cooked in a muffin tin if you want, but you can see here, this is what the batter looks like. And then we're just gonna grab cookie sheet i always recommend using like a silicone baking sheet or parchment paper um on the cookie sheet because this is a very sticky batter and then you can use like a cookie scoop and just scoop them on to your cookie sheet uh, it makes um it depends how big you want to make the cookies you can make 12 bigger cookies or 24 24 smaller cookies and then a little bit of webinar magic here, but you can pop them in the oven for about 12 to 15 minutes. And you have your cookies that are done here. So these ones I made a little bit smaller for snack sizes. Um, I think they'd make an amazing like midday treat to help satisfy your sugar craving while also giving you some of that lasting energy, protein, vitamins, minerals, omega-3 fatty acids, everything that you need. Um, but you could also make them larger cookies for breakfast, maybe serving with some extra eggs on the side or some Greek yogurt, for example. And that's everything. Yeah, those look good. I also tend to like like a, a sweet breakfast. I would eat those or I would have them in the afternoon when I just need like a little bit of a pick me up. Yeah. And at least it's going to give you like those some fiber and like a more nutritious snack than, you know, like cookies or chocolate covered granola bars that are basically chocolate bars. Exactly. <laughs> Um, we we'll just go back to our slides now. So to sum things up, um, both our brain and our body need nutrition and it has a power, powerful impact on our physical and our mental health. Try to include complex carbohydrates at, and protein at meals and snacks, and this will help keep you feeling full and will help balance your blood sugar and give you energy. Consider principles of the Mediterranean diet and the mind diet when meal planning. So trying to include that fatty fish into your diet, nuts and seeds, vegetables, um, chickpeas, beans, lentils, your pulses. Consider a vitamin D supplement and support a healthy gut brain access. So eating a fiber rich diet and including pre and probiotic foods. So we wanted to leave you with this quote here, which is consistency is more important than perfection. Just to emphasize that all of these changes we talked about don't all need to be made at once. We recommend starting small and just trying to be as consistent as you can. So when you signed up for this workshop, you provided your email address. So after this workshop, probably, I think by tomorrow, Christina, I think so. Yeah, it might just be, um, we have to upload the webinar. So it might, and it might be a large file. Yeah, so we'll see when that's done, but definitely within the week, um, you will receive a one-page summary sheet with all of the key information we talked about, as well as both the recipes and a link to our post-webinar evaluation survey. Please, 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 if you have time, it will not take you a long time, maybe a few minutes, to fill out the post-webinar evaluation form. 
it just helps us grow and tailor future webinars and future content to make sure that we're giving you what you want. Yeah, thank you. And then um, we're always sharing new content on both of our social media pages and our blogs. So you can follow us both on Instagram, Facebook, and we both have websites where we do post recipes and nutrition information and tips. Yeah. And now we have some time for questions. So we have some in the Q&A box already that we'll take a look at. Um, but please feel free to add more. Um, yes. Okay. We have a few questions here already. So the first one is how many grams per fat, how many grams of fat per day is healthy for adults? So um, yeah, Christina, you can go. I was going to say, I don't know that there is an exact amount of grams per day. We usually think, well, as health professionals, there's like percentages, like you don't want more than 10% of your um, fat intake being from saturated fat. But I mean, nobody's, I don't think it would be good for anyone to start counting how much fat is in things. Um, yeah. But I ideally at each meal, you want to include a healthy source of fat. Fat is important. It helps us absorb different vitamins and minerals. Um, so you want to have a healthy fat at each meal and generally like a serving of fat, you can think is like, um, the, the tip of your thumb. Um, but you know, like if you're having a salad, you want to put some olive oil on it because that will be, um, it will help you absorb the vitamins and minerals and it also adds flavor, right. And it's heart healthy. Yeah. Um, so you don't want to think in terms of, I wouldn't encourage you to think of how much you should be having in terms of grams per day. Yeah, I think instead of focusing just on like the grams and like trying to reach a certain amount, more so focusing on trying to incorporate them as much as you can throughout the day and like your snacks and your meals in smaller amounts, but thinking about like the types of fats that you're actually consuming. So like maybe more of those omega-3 fatty acids that we talked about earlier um, or some of the nuts and seeds, um, just things that might maybe offer you some more benefits than some of those like saturated fats or trans fats. Suggestions for vegetarian options for omega-3. So a lot of the vegetarian options, um, I'm assuming you, you mean um, not including fish. Um, okay. But so like a lot of the plant-based ones like hemp hearts, chia seeds, um, canola oil, those will give you the yeah, um, ALA, walnuts, which are good for our heart health. And we only convert small amounts of those to DPA, DPA, DHA and EPA, which are more important for brain health. Um, so if you don't eat fish, you could also consider like the um, algae, marine algae based supplements. Um, but talk to your doctor or healthcare professional before you start taking any kind of supplement. It's possible that there could be interactions depending on your personal health. Um, but yeah, anything you wanna add? Yeah, another recommendation could be seaweed too. Like I know, it might not be something that's widely consumed as much as some other options, but seaweed can be a great option too, like pairing it, like, I don't know, like sprinkling it on top of a salad or like eating it as a snack with maybe some, I keep thinking tuna, but if you're vegetarian, I don't know, maybe like a smashed chickpea salad or something with some of those hemp hearts in it. I feel like that might be a great option as well, because that will offer some of the marine like vegetables that we're looking for, for those omega-3 fatty acids. Um, another question is, is sauerkraut a good snack for gut health and weight loss? So uh -huh. yes, I definitely think um, sauerkraut can be a great snack for gut health because it does contain that fermented um, food aspect that we're looking for. So it will contain some of those probiotics. One thing I do want to note, though, is this is what I'm talking about. So sauerkraut is one of those foods where not all sauerkrauts will have probiotics in them. You want to make sure you're looking for ones that are kept specifically in the fridge. So I know there's a brand, I think it's called Wild Brine, maybe. Um, they make a really great sauerkraut option that is kept in the fridge and specifically does contain those live active cultures. So it does contain those probiotic foods. Um, so that's a great option. And yeah, it will contain some of that fiber too. So it is a great option if you're looking for something that's a little bit more um, helpful for like weight loss. The next two questions are kind of similar and they're about pro free and probiotics. So there's a lot we still don't know about probiotics. There's some 
sometimes like I like to compare taking a probiotic to like, you want to take the probiotic that suits your need. So if you had a headache, you would take Tylenol or Advil, but you wouldn't take Tums because that's for like indigestion. So it's kind of the same with probiotics. So you want to take the one that actually suits your needs. And we don't necessarily have them for everything yet. Like there's no probiotic that's known to help with mental health at this point. Um, I would focus on getting enough fiber in your diet and um, probably more so over than looking at a prebiotic supplement. I don't know of many prebiotic supplements actually. Yeah. Like I think there's foods that have been advertising more that they contain prebiotics um, just because they do contain like that fiber. And that's like a way that some food brands will market them to consumers. Um, I think in general, when we're thinking about prebiotics, you typically don't need a supplement um, we just recommend maybe making sure that you are including those prebiotic containing foods. So that could be things that include higher fiber. So like those whole grains we were talking about earlier or okay. um, oats. Yeah. Artichokes. Yeah, nice. artichokes. Another great option. Um, what were some of oh, fruits and vegetables? They can also, like I said too, especially like if you're eating something that has an edible skin, so like an apple, I, or even a cucumber, I always just recommend washing the skin and just eating it as is you definitely don't need to peel them and a lot of the fiber of some of those produce containing food produce foods um is kept in the skin so you'll get more fiber if you eat the skin my one of my overall recommendations for gut health is just to eat more fiber it's probably the number one thing most of us can do for our gut health and our health in general um because most people are not getting enough yeah. And then I think for with probiotics too, because a lot of these questions are about probiotics. So when it comes to probiotics, not every single person needs to be taking a supplement. I know it's definitely something that has becoming more and more popular recently, especially with the rise of like popularity of gut health and just taking care of your gut. Not everybody needs to be taking a supplement. The vast majority of the population typically should be fine to just eat those prebiotic containing foods and incorporating some of those probiotic containing foods um, just to help diversify the gut bacteria you already have. But like Christina was saying, probiotics are more so meant to be prescriptive for the general population. This doesn't apply to people like if you have IBS or maybe another digestive disorder or gut health disorder, these recommendations might not apply to you. Um, but just generally, uh, Probiotics are meant to be prescriptive. So certain ones, like I said, certain strains can help with different disorders that you might have. So like if, I don't know, if you're having some like gut discomfort while you're traveling, there might be a probiotic strain that might be able to help with that. Or for immune support specifically, if you're sick, um, there's, def there's different strains that are meant to help you with different functions. Um. There's a couple of questions about some detox pills, deep bloat tablets, and Lemmy gummies for bloat. I think Lemmy gummies is uh, Kourtney Kardashian's brand, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know much about these. Um, I would, my first thought is to probably stay away from them. Um, I, I find things like this, they're kind of marketed as a quick fix, and there's really no such thing as a quick fix when it comes to health. Um, and really like our liver, our heart, our kidneys, they are detoxing our body all day long. Um, so these sort of detox products are really just about people trying to make money. Yeah. And I think a lot of times too, like I know, I think some of those supplements are specifically US based. I don't think we have yeah, them in Canada definitely. yet. No. Um, but I know there's different regulations when it comes to Canadian supplements versus American supplements. And just like one thing to note too, is that a lot of these supplements might not have some like the evidence supporting them. They might just be, yeah, like Christina said, like a quick fix. And especially if it is something like bloating and you're noticing it and it's really bothering you and like kind of taking over your life, it might be something like, it might be a sign to go maybe talk to your doctor or a registered dietitian to help explore what the actual cause of that might be instead of just taking a supplement to kind of minimize it for a little bit until it comes back. Um, there might be like an underlying issue or a certain food that you're eating that might be causing that bloat that you can explore with a dietitian and they can kind of help create a more tailored approach to helping you actually overcome that issue. 
Um, and then there's another question here. Eggs seem to be good for brain health, but should I eat them if I have hypertension? So I think with anything, um, I always recommend like a moderate, uh, approaching things from a moderation and balance perspective. So I think eggs can definitely be incorporated into your lifestyle. Even if you do have hypertension, um, I think they can easily be used as like the protein source of your breakfast, for example, but maybe not relying on them as like your only source of protein throughout the day. So making sure that you are incorporating other types of lean proteins and other types of nutrients to make sure that you're getting some of those other vitamins and minerals that we were talking about earlier. Um, so maybe having some like fatty fish in, in there to make sure you're getting those omega threes. Uh, yeah, just moderation is my all, always answer, but Christina, do you have any other? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, in, in my practice, like I've been working for a while, I, I don't think I've really ever restricted eggs for people. Um, especially I worked with a population that um, food security was an issue and eggs are a really affordable source of protein. Um, so yeah, I agree, you know, moderation, including different types of protein sources. Um, and then this is a very individual question about your health. So just encourage you to talk to your healthcare professional about it as well. Yeah, I definitely agree. Wow, this is great timing though. Yeah, I, this, that was our last question and it's just 10, 102 now. Which is perfect. So yeah, yeah we you. just want to yeah, say thank you again to everybody that did attend. Um, and if you weren't able to join us live, thank you for watching this recording. Um, yeah, make and sure thank you to Produce Made Simple and Get Cracking, the Egg Farmers of Canada for supporting this webinar. Yeah, I hope everybody took away at least one piece of information that they might not have known before. And if you want to give us both a follow or check out both yeah. of our blogs, you'll definitely find some recipes that you can incorporate some of these nutrients a little bit more into your diet. Yeah. Okay. Well, Thanks, hope you all have a good rest of your week and hope